So I'm going to talk about our research using uh, mobile EEG and augmented reality to study the impact of context on object recognition in the real world. So to give you guys a bit of background, uh, we know that the environment in which objects are located can impact our ability to recognize these objects. So the way this happens is that uh, when you're walking around uh, an environment such as this outdoor environment here, you start making predictions about what kind of objects could appear in the environment. So you might predict to see uh, things like plants, like trees. You might predict to see a bench like this one or animals like this beaver here. And these predictions can help us recognize objects quickly. However, when these predictions are violated, such as seeing a beaver in an office environment, our ability to recognize the object slows down. And this has been shown through various uh, behavioral neuroimaging studies showing slower response times to objects that are inconsistent with the environment compared to objects consistent with the environment. And in terms of ERP studies, uh, it's shown that uh, there's large amplitudes of the N300 and N400 potentials to objects that are inconsistent with the environment, suggesting that inconsistent objects take more effort to process than objects that are consistent with the environment. However, when these studies are done, typically you present participants with an image of a scene followed by an image of an object or you might see the picture of the object first, followed by the scene. But this is pretty different from how we see objects in the real world. So typically, we, so in other words, the objects are separated from a coherent spatial temporal context, which is how we see them in the real world. Uh, for example, this car here is embedded in a coherent context like this. So this is what we wanted to investigate in our research here. What is the impact of uh, the context uh, when the objects are embedded in a coherent spatial temporal context like the real world? So to do that, uh, we needed to record uh, neural activity in real environments, uh, to which we use mobile EEG. Uh, but we still wanted to control what kind of objects uh, participants saw, the variety of the objects that they might see, and when participants see the objects, uh, which we use augmented reality to control. So I'll just take you through our augmented reality and mobile EEG setups. So for augmented reality, we use the whole lens, um, which looks like this. Uh, thing here. Um, and for those that don't know, it presents two-dimensional or three-dimensional objects into the real world, like this chameleon here, and they can even be animated. And it presents objects in up to 60 frames a second. And as I follow this chameleon around with my eyes, it'll track my eye movements with 30 hertz eye tracking, and it also keep track of my uh, head position and orientation using accelerometers and a gyroscope. And the other thing that our lens can do is take scans of the real world, a visual demonstration of which you'll see here with these blue triangles, that's the whole lens scanning the real world. So as you walk around the real world, it's continuously scanning it, and it puts these scans together into a, a three-dimensional map of the real world, an example of which you can see here, which may not look the most coherent at first glance, but you can probably make out a stairwell here, and a wall and some windows, and a courtyard here, and an outdoor wall and some windows here. So these 3D maps are useful as I can use them to be able to accurately place uh, virtual objects into the real world. Uh, one thing you might have noticed though is there's a, a few holes in the map, uh, but that's okay as we don't need a complete map uh, to be able to place the objects accurately. We just need enough uh, to be able to see where the objects are gonna go. So to be able to use the map to place objects into the real world, uh, what I do is I import the map into 3D modeling software such as Unity or Unreal. Here's an example of me doing that in Unity. Um, so this is the same app as you saw on the previous uh, slide, but from the top down view. And this is the same room that you saw uh, in that first video with the chameleon. And this is the table the chameleon was cycling along. And if I wanted to place an object onto that table, all I have to do is create or import an object into Unity, like this loudspeaker object here. And I just drag it onto the table in my 3D map. And then I export this application uh, to the HoloLens and I run the application on the HoloLens and it will present that object exactly where I want it in the real world. In this case, it would present it on that table you saw in the first video. And then an additional thing uh, which I use here uh, is a software package called Experimenter, which if you want, guys wanna sort of use virtual reality or augmented reality, it's a really useful tool as it allows you to create psychology experiments really quickly with a point and click interface. So that's our augmented reality setup. Um, so I'll just talk you through our mobile EEG setup. So for that, we use the Bring Products Live Amp 64 channel system. 
Um, and you can see it here in the top left corner. And you can see that it has flat electrodes, which is quite convenient in terms of comfort um, when you're placing a head mounted device on top of it as it reduces any discomfort. Uh, as well, and the amplifiers are wireless and allow for onboard recording. So when participants are wandering around the real world, all they need to take with them is the amplifier and they don't need an additional recording laptop, for example. Uh, oh yes, and the uh, electrodes are actively shielded. So when participants are moving around, that reduces any noise uh, that might be generated. So that's our mobile EEG setup. Uh, so I'll just take you through our task. So what participants have to do is they have to find these arrows, which are placed around a couple of environments in our task. And when they get close enough to the arrows, the arrows will turn green, indicating to the participant that they need to press a button on the button box here. And when they press the button, it causes an object to be presented to them. And at the same time, it sends a five volt signal to the live amp, which converts that into a trigger, which is marked in the EEG signal, allowing us to create an epoch around the period of time in which the object is presented. So as I say, the participant presses a button, an object appears, and all the participant has to do is uh, look at the object for as long as it's visible. And then when the object disappears, they're presented with a question asking them how expected they found the object on a scale from one to five, with one being unexpected and five being expected. So uh, for our uh, overall experiment, we have 80 objects, 40 of which are placed uh, outdoors, uh, an example of which you can see here, and 40 of which are placed indoors. And half the objects on, in each of the environments are inconsistent with the environment, and half the objects are consistent with the environment. Now, you can see there's a slight error in the position of the blue arrow and that it's moving around a bit. But once you stand in front of it, it stabilizes, and it's pretty clear what the location is and what the object is. And this is... Uh, Yeah, there we go. So this is an example of one of the indoor trials, and you can see that the location of the blue arrow is a bit more stable uh, compared to the outdoor one. The HoloLens uh, seems to prefer indoor uh, environments rather than outdoor ones, but it still seems pretty accurate in both environments. So that's our task. And so far we've recorded data uh, from a couple of the participants. Um, so I'm gonna show you some of that EEG data. Uh, so this is the raw data as it comes in. And you can see that the quality is similar to lab-based uh, EEG setups. And for our pre-processing pipeline, it's pretty similar to uh, standard EEG pre-processing pipelines. So we just start off with bandpass filtering the data. We do some visual bad channel detection, and then we interpolate the bad channels that were removed. Do some automated data cleaning just with the EEG lab functions. Um, and then we epoch the data to plus and minus two seconds of the appearance of the object, at which point the data looks like this. And you can still see there's a couple of eye movement or blink components here. Uh, and to remove the remaining artifacts, we do some visual trial detection followed by ICA, which removes the eye components or blinks. And the data looks nice and clean here. Some of you may have spotted that there's three noisy, what looks like three noisy electrodes at the bottom. They're actually accelerometers and not electrodes. So not included in any analyses or anything. So I'll just show you now an example of uh, the visually evoked responses that we get. So you can see across all trials, we get nice clean N170 on one of our aceptal electrodes. Uh, this is for one participant. So you can see that with our augmented reality design, we're getting some pretty reliable uh, visually evoked responses. And then just as an example of differences between conditions, uh, the black is the mean for inconsistent trials and the blue the mean for consistent trials. And you can see that there's some differences at around 250 milliseconds and some differences potentially around 300, 390 milliseconds. Uh, but this is for one participant, so I'm not going to draw any conclusions. It's just nice to see that we get some reliable visually evoked responses, um, that once we've collected all our data, hopefully we'll be able to see some differences between conditions. So the next steps are, of course, to uh, collect the rest of our participants, the rest of our data, and then do some data analysis, um, where we're planning on starting off with the ERPs analysis, um, as previously, it's been shown uh, that you find large amplitudes of the N300 and N400 to inconsistent objects compared to consistent objects. So we want to see whether we're going to get the same sort of results. And then we're also interested in uh, when the visual and semantic features of the objects are represented in our EEG data. So we're going to use representational similarity analyses to take a look at that. And then we can also look at the eye tracking data. We can look at uh, the fixation durations when participants are looking at objects and how that changes between conditions to get an idea of how long participants need to process the objects uh, to recognize them. 
And then we can also look at the dispersion uh, either across the whole experiment or for individual trials and how that changes between conditions. So that's as far as we've gotten. Uh, so just to summarize, it seems that we can use this mobile EEG set, mobile and augmented reality uh, setup uh, to get some reliable visually evoked responses. And hopefully once we've collected all our data, we can use this to see whether there's an impact of context on object recognition in the real world. So I'll just thank uh, my collaborators uh, at Cambridge, uh, Alex and Ali, and then at the University of to Toronto, Carr. And uh, thank you guys for listening. And if you've got any questions or you want to see the experiment for yourself, you're welcome to come and take part if you give me an email. But uh, thanks for that. Thanks very much, Victoria. Um, any questions? <laughs>